All right, hello. So I'm showing you a quick uh, video overview of the PicoScope PS6000. I have a longer, more detailed review posted on my blog, so at colonoflynn.com, and this goes through a whole bunch of detail about uh, <coughs> specific points of this scope. Uh, I just want to give you a bit of an overview, so if you just want to watch one video, uh, you can get an idea of what I talk about in my review. So the, the PS6000 comes in a nice little box like this, um, and inside it you have the PicoScope device itself, its power supply, and the top half of it here is a um, storage. So behind here we have the scope probes and whatnot, which I'll talk about, I'll pull one of those out, uh, as well as the power adapter cord. Uh, interestingly, it comes with, I guess PicoScope itself is a bit of a uh, worldwide company with the original design, I believe, in the UK. But so they give you a whole bunch of uh, different plugs for it. So of course they give you the UK uh, plug, uh, the European plug, as you also probably expect, the American one, and they even give you an Australian plug, so nobody gets left out. Um, of course, also the USB 3.0 cable for this USB 3.0 scope. So anyway, let's look at the scope itself first. Um, the front side here, we have the, this is a four channel model. Um, so we have A, B, C, D, and in the middle here is the probe compensation test point. What's really cool, this has a 50 ohm mode, so this is really handy if you want to use this with other test equipment. Um, or you can use this, for example, as the front end of a radio if you were trying to do some software to find radio stuff, and this will play really nicely with other devices. Uh, in 50 ohm mode, you're limited to plus minus 5 volt. This is very typical for most test equipment that has this 50 ohm input. You'll see a limit like that, uh, of course, which is due to the power dissipation in the 50 ohm termination. Uh, in the 1 mega ohm, input maybe the more normal version you're limited to plus minus 20 volt uh, as the maximum range so on the back side so those are the four adc channels um, on the back side we also have two additional channels so one's an input one's an output and you can switch what these are used for uh, so for example the input one can be used as an external trigger input this is very handy because remember that this is a 5 giga sample per second scope, but that's if you're just using a single channel. If you want to trigger on a second channel, and say measure channel A but trigger on channel B, you'd have to enable both channels and you'd be losing out. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get 5 giga samples per second on both channels. You could, however, trigger on the external input and still sample at 5 giga samples per second. So there's a lot of reasons you might want to use this instead of an additional channel or of course if you have all four channels measuring you can just use this as the trigger um, there is also an output the output is probably most people use it for if this you enable the arbitrary waveform generator or signal generator um, this will be the output for that there is alternative functions so it's mostly in the API the software controlled mode um, and by software controlled, I mean a programming language, the programming API. You can use this as a reference clock input. So the sampling, the ADCs inside this, what they use as their sample clock will actually be locked to this input. Or you can output the ADC, uh, a reference clock here, which is also locked to the internal sample clock. Why might you want to do that? Um, one of the obvious reasons is you had a bunch of these, so you wanted eight channels, you could synchronize them all. But other things, like if you wanted to use this for software-defined radio, um, you may want to have the sampling locked to a recovered clock or some other clock. And again, this will let you do that, having that external clock input. You may have to do a little bit of um, sort of pre-processing on the clock you put in because there's only certain valid ranges, although it's more flexible than a lot of devices only let you put 10 megahertz in. Uh, this one, it has a few valid clock frequencies you can put in. And I also mentioned, I'll plug this in in a second here, um, the probes. The probes I really like. I have a separate review you can watch uh, about them. So, you know, these are 
originally, at first they looked like your sort of standard oscilloscope probe. Um, and let me put something behind this so you can see better. Sort of standard oscilloscope probe. Um, and it's not switchable, it's always 1 to 10, which is basically just to give you the very high, so these are 350 megahertz analog bandwidth, and I believe there's the all 500 megahertz version of this probe if you have a, um, to match your, your scope bandwidth. But anyway, so what I really like about these is the tips. The tips um, are A, removable. I don't know if you can fully see that here. There we go. Um, and B, the default ones it comes with are spring-loaded. Uh, so this makes it a lot easier, and I have a video showing you this, but for example, they're so fine that you can in fact probe a via on a PCB, and because it's spring-loaded, you can break through the solder mask uh, and just probe right into a via without doing anything. So you don't even really need test pads on your uh, PCB when you're probing it. It also has a nicer, a shorter ground path connection here, um, and it has this really wide thing that you can fit a bunch of different... Um, there's some special advanced probes, I believe, or that fit there. But the combination of this removable probe tip, which I won't take out because they don't have tweezers to do it properly, um, as well as the spring-loaded uh, feature is really great. This is a huge improvement, I think, in, you know, it's something that's really simple, but it makes your life a lot easier. And they give you a few extra replacement, I believe they're solid probe tips. Um, in there, but you can buy replacement probe tips for not very much. I think a pack of five was like twenty dollars or something. So uh, the problem is that without removable probe tips, and I've had this happen, if you're using the tip and you bend it by accident, you're absolutely screwed. You have to throw away your scope probe and buy a whole new one um, because there's no way to fix it. With the removable tips, if you bend this, it's no big deal. Just buy a new tip, switch the tip out. Um, so that's really a huge improvement. Uh, over sort of more traditional scope probes. And you can actually do some cool stuff like I, uh, again, there's a separate video showing you how to do this, but I built a, uh, a holder. So I use this, oops, fix this thing here. Um, I use this magnetic base. It's actually normally used for um, machining. And you can basically make a adapter to hold the probe, the scope probe tip against your PCB. So there's lots of cool stuff you can do, especially the spring loaded is really helpful there. So let's talk some more about the device itself. Um, so let me get a power adapter here. So one common complaint with USB scopes I've seen is that people think. It's bad that these channels are going to be connected to the USB ground, which is true. So if I plug this in, USB here, there's my USB cable, and I get no meter. Um, let's see if you can see that. There we go. So first off, obviously all of the channel grounds are more or less connected together. Uh, and this is the same for most or all, you know, all scopes, unless they're specially designed to be isolated. And if I measure the resistance between that and the, the USB ground, you can also see that's connected together. But the thing is, if you look at, which is a number of Agilent ones, um, the ground of the probes is connected to system earth ground which isn't any better. You don't have any um, advantage of that versus the USB ground, to my knowledge. So the Pigo scope itself is supposed to have some, you know, it does have filtering on the uh, USB device. It's the USB pathway, so you shouldn't get any noise from your computer into the scope, obviously. Um, but there's no real advantage compared to, say, a regular scope because it also has a limitation that the ground is connected to something. In fact, this is probably a bit of an float your laptop uh, by just not having it connected to AC and the power adapter itself uh, is normally isolated. So if you measure the negative to the uh, 
AC, it's going to be completely isolated. This is how most switching power supplies work. So let me go ahead and plug this in. There we go. You'll notice a nice feature is that when you have the power in but no USB, it doesn't turn on at all. Once I plug the USB in, we get a power light. Um, but the whole system hasn't started up, so let me start the PicoScope software. And you probably won't be able to hear it because my computer fans are running, but there's a few fans that'll kick in on the PicoScope itself. So there we go. And you can see this light here is actually blinking uh, for each capture. You probably can't really see it because of the limited frame rate, but if I do this singly, you'll see. So there we go. So I can run and stop. Um, all right, so let me just turn off the video here. And we'll switch entirely to looking in the PicoScope software. Um, so there's some cool features here. And again, look at my review for a lot more detail, uh, specific detail on this. I'm just going to show you a few quick things of interest, I think. So let's turn on auto, no, no triggering, so it's just running all the time. And I'll get a probe here, connect it up. And so there's just some random noise happening here. Um, I'm just holding the probe in my hand. You can't see that. So let's get a somewhat interesting signal. I'll enable the signal generator here. And I have the arbitrary signal generator. This is actually really cool because you can load, if I want to use this, I can request that it loads data uh, from the one of the channels. So let's see. Uh, so there's whatever data was in the channel and I could replay that. Uh, it has some functions to generate stuff from a binary bitstream. Um, so there is a few more features there. This is handy because I've previously had arbitrary waveform generators in a scope and the software just wasn't good enough to um, to make it useful. So it's nice to see there's actually some hope of doing stuff. Anyway, so let's turn on something. Uh, let's just start with a sine wave. Um, so we'll make it simple and I'm just going to take my probe, reach it around back and put it in okay there we go so all I have is uh, let's turn the webcam back on here okay so we have the picoscope going around and then I'm just resting the probe in the back so nothing too crazy. Um, but let's make that frequency. Let's go up to a megahertz, say. Uh, all right, simple enough. Uh, so with the PicoScope, we can switch the, um, the time base like you'd expect. Set a trigger up. So at this point, it's looking like a pretty standard scope. There is, as I wanted to mention, a few really cool features, and you can go through all more of this in my debt specific reviews. Again, there's the 50 ohm input mode, uh, which is very useful if you want to interface this to other devices, especially say you're doing work like uh, looking at the output of an FPGA clock or something. You can connect that directly to the scope through an SMA or BNC connector on the FPGA board and have it properly terminated so you don't get reflections. Um, this is an extremely important feature for doing high-speed design. There is a cool mode called Equivalent Time Sampling, ETS. In ETS mode, it actually um, your sample rate goes beyond the theoretical the 5 giga sample per second limit. So this only works for repetitive signals. And we can see here in the side, it's saying sampling at 200 giga samples per second. Um, there is a lot of caveats about how this works, but, and I have some demos that show this again, look at the videos. You can do interesting things like measuring phase shift. You could even measure the phase shift over a, um, a few 
millimeters of PCB trace, you have enough accuracy. So it's quite interesting. And for again, for high speed design, especially doing stuff like high speed um, digital design, where you're concerned about possible phase delay between signals, uh, that equivalent time sampling is actually an extremely useful feature. There is, of course, um, some, and I don't have a digital source right here, but you can do serial decoding. Again, check out my um, other video to show the details of that. What's important, though, is that all of these, these features are just provided for free, so you don't have to buy add-ons. Uh, I hate when places, they sell you something, and then every time you need the new feature, it's an add-on. So this way, you're just, you have it. Um, one other thing I meant to mention here is that some people don't like the fact that there's no knobs to twiddle. So one thing you can do, and what I've done here, is you can actually build a box with knobs to twiddle. And this connects via USB and just enumerates as a keyboard. And it uses the keyboard shortcut feature in the PicoScope device to do stuff like switching the, um, the voltage range, the time base, oh, this is time base, sorry. Um, again, there's, I have all the schematics for this. This obviously isn't an official real product. Uh, but it's just something you can build if you're interested. So you can just have that and that, and now you have real knobs that will affect the software. All right, so that's sort of uh, just real quick overview of uh, some of the stuff in the PS6000. As I mentioned, there is a lot more details uh, on my blog here, and this includes a lot of comparisons to other devices, other Agilent scopes, um, and a bunch more detailed examples of using some of the features. Oh, one more thing I do want to mention. When you're looking at the scopes, most of them, I think, have this FFT mode. So it's doing an FFT of the input data to give you a frequency spectrum. One thing that they don't always make clear is the length of the FFT. So if you have something like a 2048 um, point FFT, you might say, okay, that's fine. And what the more points does is gives you more frequency resolution effectively. So you can see I'm increasing it there. And the width, the frequency resolution is appears to be increasing. Now the problem is that when you do an FFT in an oscilloscope, uh, it's not like a spectrum analyzer. You always start from zero megahertz and you go up to whatever frequency is of interest. So say I'm interested in a you know one megahertz bandwidth around 100 megahertz. I have no choice but to do an FFT, which includes all this stuff from zero onward. And I just have to zoom in on the frequency of interest. So say I want to go from 99 to 101 megahertz. Um, well, now that that 2048 points is not looking very good at all. Um, and there's nothing you can do. And if it gets worse, obviously, I'm not even in the full 350 megahertz bandwidth. So this is why you may want a scope that has more FFT points. So I point this out specifically when I was looking at devices, I noticed the, I believe the Rigels did have a limited FFT. The Agilent or Tektronic uh, had larger FFTs. So I think, I don't know if it was 16,000 um, or 32,000, but it was, it was somewhat larger. The problem is that um, you will not have the resolution you need when you zoom in. So the PicoScope is particularly nice because it's done in software on your computer. It can basically be, you know, it doesn't matter. They can make it as big as you want. It's not having to do on dedicated processing. So now when I zoom in, um, I still have a lot of good resolution right around the, uh, the frequency of interest compared to, say, 2048 points when I basically, oops, that's too low. When I've zoomed in and there's nothing, I'm screwed. So... All right, I think that's all I wanted to talk about for the, uh, the PS6000. So as I mentioned, check out all the other videos for more details.